All right, Steve, let's take our spots. Okay. You know, we, we got to do this like show and tell thing today. Maybe I should do a little background research, like Google diabetes real quick. Let's see what that says. Yeah, we got we to gotta prepare. Yeah. All right, so it says diabetes is a disease in which your blood glucose or blood sugar levels are too high. Well, that's not too helpful. No, no way. Hey, hey guys, we're, we're live. What's that? You want to line? No, we're live. We're live. We're live. Right now. All right. Well, Steve, I think we're just going to have to wing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Taking Control of Your Diabetes show and tell. And the topic for today is how to prevent and treat extreme highs and lows. So I am Dr. Jeremy Pettis. I'm an endocrinologist at the University of California, San Diego work here at Taking Control of Your Diabetes. I've had type one diabetes since I was 15. I'm Steve Edelman. I trained Dr. Pettis to become an endocrinologist. I got type one when I was 15, just a few years before. So, you know, why this topic? I mean, really when it comes to diabetes, there's nothing more maddening than those extreme highs and extreme lows, am I right? Those are the times that you really just wanna throw your stuff against the, the, the wall and just kind of like be like, God, this disease can really suck. So I don't have to think too far in the distant past to come up with an example of my extreme highs and extreme lows. So right now, um, well, typically I'm on a hybrid closed loop pump. I actually use the Tandem Control IQ. We're going on a big family trip to Hawaii in a couple of weeks. So I said, well, I'm gonna transfer, I'm gonna come off the pump, go back to shots because I'm gonna be in and out of the water and don't wanna deal with being on a pump. And being like that transition going on to, to injections from the pump, it just hasn't gone well. And last night, I actually, <clears throat> or actually kind of early this morning, I went low, like a low around like 70 or whatever, got up. What did I do? Ate everything in sight because it's impossible to, you know, stop eating sometimes when you're low. And my blood sugars like went up high. My alarm went off, but I thought I was going to exercise this morning. So I didn't want to like treat my high because I was going to, you know, work it down, kind of ignored it. Long story short, I wake up at 340 this morning probably the highest I've been in a long time. So it's just to, to say, um, it can happen to, to anybody. It happens to you. It happens to me. Um, there's no shame in it. We obviously want to avoid these things. There's kind of shame in it. Well, I know he was giving me a bunch of crap and it's, 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 I'm embarrassed. Well, listen, I I'm on a hybrid closed loop system now. And I had a little party over the weekend and Sure enough, I woke up middle of the night, 250 plus. And you know, the thing is, we're doctors, we treat people with diabetes, but it's just difficult. And we'll, we'll be speaking to mostly people with type one, but a lot of you folks with type two have ups and downs as well. So welcome everybody. Yeah, and thanks for the invitation to that party. <laughs> Sounds like it was a lot of fun, geez. Yeah, you were there. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's get into the meat of it. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of break this down into addressing highs and then addressing lows. So we're starting with highs and just some practical tips that we give people um, in terms of ways to avoid highs. So first of all, like a bullet that we wanna talk about is insulin timing. This is really important and it's probably the most important thing we can tell anybody on pre-meal fast acting insulin. Yeah, well, so we'll spend a bit of time on this because the bottom line is, it takes your quote unquote rapid acting injectable insulin 20 to 30 minutes to start doing anything. So I think we've been done a disservice by calling these rapid acting insulins because people think I inject, I have to eat right away because if I don't, I'm gonna plummet low. It's actually quite the opposite. Every patient I see with type one diabetes that's on injectable insulin, I spend a lot of time talking about what we call pre-bolusing, taking your insulin 20 to 30 minutes before you eat because you wanna have that insulin start to work by the time that you start eating carbs. And I'll say one more thing and kick it over to you. Yeah. Because remember, when you eat carbs, they can turn into glucose in five, maybe 10 minutes. So you need your insulin to be working when you start eating. So you have to give your insulin a little bit of a runway. Otherwise, you're always gonna spike high. Yeah, and just to add a little bit more sophistication to that explanation is that it really depends what your blood sugar is when you're thinking about giving yourself insulin before the meal. Mm -hmm. So if you're 200, uh, 20 minutes is not long enough. Right. Uh, you know, if your blood sugar is pretty good, 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes is good. And it's trial and error. And it also turns, depends on your trend arrow. Yeah. You, you're 140 with a trend arrow like this. <laughs> you really want to give yourself insulin earlier than that. Right. So there's so many decisions to make. And that's where you can really rely on your continuous glucose monitor and really 
you know, we should say that everybody we want on a CGM, all the type ones, type twos on insulin, because otherwise it's really hard. You don't even know if you're high or low. So we're kind of working under the assumption that people are using that technology because it's amazing. So another trick is if you don't want to be beholden to this 20 to 30 minute rule, because every situation is different, the time of day you're injecting, how much exercise you've had, et cetera, et cetera. You can use this trick uh, coined by Stephen Ponder, which I really like called waiting for the bend where you inject your insulin. And if your blood sugar is kind of flat, you wait for it to just start ticking down just a tick. And you can almost feel that sometimes like you can feel like getting a little bit hungry or your insulin is starting to work. And that's when you know you can start eating because your insulin is working. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, we have to pay attention to those trend arrows and the ambient glucose level that you're starting from. And there's just no easy formula that one size fits all. Yeah. Now, Steve, what do you say when someone says, okay, great, you know, injecting 20, 30 minutes before I eat, but I don't know how much I'm going to eat. Like how much do I inject? What do you tell people for that? Well, you know what? <clears throat> I tell them to think about the usual amount that you're going to eat for that meal or how much insulin you're going to take cut it in half and give it early. So at least you got some insulin on board. And if you decide to eat less, if your wife is terrible cook, then you know you, you don't have the full insulin or your husband, uh, you don't have the full insulin on board. So. Yeah, exactly. So I tell people, let's say dinner is normally 50 grams of carbs, whatever it is. In, in, in bolus for 20, 30 grams of carbs, you know you're gonna eat at least that much, but having just that little amount of insulin on board makes a huge difference. And then when you sit down to eat, you can bolus for the rest. A lot easier to do if you're on a pump than you know injections with the multiple injections, but you can still do it with MBI. Yeah. But if you don't take anything else from this talk, that's probably the most useful kind of practical thing. Um, this pre-bolus thing is something I talk to basically every patient about. Now, I don't think you have an answer to this question, but how do you remember? How do you remember? To take your insulin early. I mean, it's just like, how do you remember to take insulin ever? I mean, you just kind of do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, All right. Well, I, I mean, like, you just have to know, like, gosh, I'm eating more. I should probably take more. It's just like if you eat. It's a habit. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Um, all right. So tip number two. So first was pre bolusing Number two, reducing carbs or eating carbs later in the meal. So let's talk about reducing carb, kind of a quote unquote, low carb diet. What, what is your diet strategy when it comes to carbs? How do you think about it? Yeah. You know what? I, you know, I'm not a uh, carb counter myself, never brought, was brought up on it, but I know what carbs are. You know, carbs take many different forms and I don't, I'm not a zealot of zero carb diet. Some of you are out there, more power to you. But I just try to, when I look at a meal, I'm, take, I'm trying to eat less carbs, more protein uh, and vegetables and salads and things like that. But I love carbs, you know, and I try to limit that. So uh, I make a hamburger at home with a English muffin, which is half the carbs and, and then a big, huge hamburger bun, things like that. Yeah. And, um, oh, last night, got a cauliflower rice uh, cauliflower crust pizza. And I can tell you, it did not wreck my blood sugars. Yeah, those are actually pretty good. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm with you. I'm not like, you know, when people say low carb, what does that mean? First of all, when you take most type ones, we tend to, or, or people with diabetes in general, we tend to eat lower carb without even really thinking about it compared to kind of the normal population. Why? Because we, we kind of pay the price when we eat high carb. Yeah. So I, I try to eat lower carb when I'm going kind of like profoundly or being more aggressive about it. I would say if you're eating 30 grams of carbs or less per meal, that's pretty low carb. Yeah. And to be honest, nothing can help eliminate spikes after meals better than being low carb. It's hard to maintain because we love carbs. Um, and so to be honest, what'll happen is my blood sugars, I'll be having a, a rough couple of weeks. I'll really get on the low carb bus and then I'll kind of creep back into eating like kind of crappy again, and then kind of oscillate back and forth. But when I really want to get back on track, nothing gets me back to where I should be, should be better than low carb. Yeah. You know, just things like you go to a restaurant, they have an awesome hamburger. You might be able to get away with not eating the whole bun, right? Things like that. And it's very tough to stay extremely low carbs. But one thing you just said that reminds me of this whole, the theme of this whole program today, you know, the goal for diabetes is to avoid the highs and the lows, because if you can avoid the highs, you can avoid all the things you have to do to bring it down. We'll talk about extra insulin, stacking your dose. And if you can avoid the lows, you can avoid eating everything in the fridge when you get low. And if you can avoid those extremes, your time and range is going to be 
much better and right. you're going to be less frustrated. No one likes yeah, to you be know, that's, bouncing around. That's super, I'm super glad you brought that up because what's, what's the pattern with, with type 1 diabetes? Well, it's this. Um, you eat, you go high after your meal, you get pissed off, you do what we call a rage bolus, you take a bunch of insulin, you go low, you start eating everything, you kind of rebound high and you get on that roller coaster. And step one to getting off that roller coaster is avoiding that spike in the first place. So it's all about being more proactive with your diabetes, being kind of more aggressive with your insulin dosing before you eat to avoid that spike in the first place, rather than eat, go high, react to that high and go low and always kind of chasing it. And once you get on that roller coaster, it's tough yeah. to get off. You know, this is off track a, a little bit, but for my 40th birthday, someone gave me a t-shirt <clears throat> called 40 land. And it was like an amusement park for old people. And it had one of the things besides prunes on a stick, it had the world's flattest roller coaster. <laughs> and I keep thinking, I wish my blood sugars were like that all the time. I'll show you the t-shirt. We were just talking about that. That over the hill concept for 40 just doesn't exist anymore. Thank God. Um, Cause I just recently turned 40. Um, 40 is the new 20, right? Yeah. Good. Anyways. Okay. So what if you don't want to eat low carb or, it, you know, having a hard time with that? Um, another thing you can do is if you're eating carbs, at least try to eat them maybe later in the meal. So if you have a plate that there's rice and this and this on it, um, eat the, the protein and the vegetables first so that you're eating the carbs later, maybe when the insulin's kicking in. Hard to do, but it's just something to be mindful of that it's really the carbs that's gonna cause the high, like immediate spike in your in your blood sugar. Yeah, when you, when you first said that, I'm thinking there's, eat it later, what's the difference? But you're right, it gives the insulin more time to work. Now, if you have type two and you're on insulin, you're in the same boat as folks with type one. If you're not on mealtime insulin, there's other things you can do to prevent your blood sugars from spiking. Right. And that's, really reducing the carbs, trying to get some exercise right after eating. Right. And, you know, thanks to Atkins and all these kind of low carb crazes, um, there's lots of options. I do. I don't mind a lettuce wrapped burger or cauliflower rice yeah. or, um, you know, you can find alcohol, hard alcohol with, you know, diet mixers, very low carb. So there's ways around it. That you don't have to suffer um, anyways. All right. So another tip. So tip one, pre bolus. Tip two, low carb or, or later in the meal. Tip three is splitting up your meal. So Steve used to give me a hard time, still does all the time, that when I get a sandwich, I inhale the first half of it right away. And yeah. then I just wait for the second half to see kind of what my blood sugars are, if I need to take another bolus or whatever. But basically what that's doing is allowing you multiple times to kind of intervene with your your meal rather than trying to get the dose right with just one literal shot you have kind of multiple attempts or little taps you can do um with your meal yeah it, it's easier said than done yeah you know how do you sit down to a meal when you're starving and eat first of all eat slow you know i have a problem with eating too fast and then say okay i'm going to eat half of this later so you you know you you tell the person at the restaurant you like a take home, you know, container before, when you get your meal, you cut it in half, you put it in there. As soon as you finish your first half, you open up your container, yeah. eat the rest of the, at the, at the restaurant. It, it's tough. And if you could do it, it's just kind of the same concept of eating most of your carbs later on in the right. meal. Uh, some people can do it. Uh, and if you can do it, it, it helps overload your system with all the carbs that get absorbed here. Yeah. GI tract. So I have more self-control than Steve. I'm able to do this and you just inhale all your food. <laughs> just like full Hoover vacuum situation on the food. All right. So next point, treating your lows properly to avoid that rebound. So I mentioned that I was um, victim of this just today where I went low and I got out of bed and I ate everything in sight. So here's the thing. When you go low at night, if you get out of bed, you're not going to stop eating. Get out of bed, you're dead. You're, yeah, <laughs> I mean, in so many words. So one real practical thing that I've done, and, and you know, uh, I think Steve does too, is I have a little juice by my bed. And I know if I drink that, I usually actually drink about half of it. It's these little, we call them grenades, these little um, Martinelli, Martinelli, like apple juice things. Get them at Costco. Yeah, you get a whole crate of them. And I know if I drink half of that, I should be fine. And yeah, the problem is for 10, 15 minutes, you don't feel good. Right. And you can easily convince yourself, I need more. I should get up, like whatever. But if you just hang tight, stay in bed, don't get out of bed, you can really avoid that, that high spike after, you know. I think low. that's the hardest thing. Yeah. You still feel low. And even just drinking half that container is tough. Right. And you know what? It's so true. Uh, when I, when I, I told you I had the party, I got low at night. 
and I went to the freezer where I froze part of the cake oh my God. from the party. Yeah. And I ate a big chunk of cake. It was so good. I didn't, even, in fact, it was good, but I ate it so fast. I did, probably didn't enjoy it. And then I wake up at 250 plus. Yeah. Um, you get out of bed, you just, you know, you've all been there. It's that, it's a physiologic response. It's the fight or flight kind of response. Hey, your body's saying, if you don't get glucose in your system, you're going to pass out. Right. And you just like keep eating and everything tastes delicious. This is another problem. Peanut butter. Oh my God. And yeah, I love peanut butter, cheese, these things that will just not help me right now, but together screw me over. Yeah. Dip the cheese <laughs> in the peanut butter. All right. So those are some kind of practical tips. So we haven't mentioned specifically new therapies yet. So this was all, you know, approach to carbs and meals that, you know, will kind of uh, go throughout this, this presentation, but let's talk about new therapies. So I mentioned that our rapid acting insulins are not that rapid acting. Thankfully, we have several new options and we've done multiple different talks on, on these you know, things um, that, that I'll get to. So let's talk about some of the new um, injectable insulins. Okay, we have uh, made by Lily, Lumjev, uh, faster acting Umalog, mm -hmm. and we have Fiasp made by Novo, factor, fa <laughs> fatter, faster acting Aspart. And right. Well, how would you, what, what would you say is what's the difference be between these two and right. Humalog and Novolog? So basically that's exactly right. That we have Humalog and Novolog. Everybody knows those we've had forever. And now Humalog has a new version called Lumjev and Novolog has a new version called Fiasp. And they basically, they're the exact same insulins. They've added a few, what they call excipients. It's something to put in the special sauce, if you will, of the insulin to make it get absorbed a little bit faster. Um, so if you want to go on one of these injectables, they can start working just a little bit faster, not fast enough that I would say change anything that I just told you, you still need to pre bolus, it's still not fast enough to inject right when you eat, but you might notice um, that if you do that you get you know slightly different, you know, or better results and they've studied this obviously, and know that if you use basically FIAS versus Novolog, instead of spiking up super high you get a little bit of a less of a spike. Yeah, you're you're 30, 40 milligrams lower at the peak, exactly. which is, which is not anything. It's something. And also the insulin gets out of your system a little faster. Too. Right. And that might reduce your chance for a low blood sugar later on. Right. So Fiesp has been around a little bit longer and it's available in vials and you can, it's approved for pumps. Lumjeb also comes in vials, but it's not technically approved for pumps um, yet. So these are new options that, you know, people are using. And, and I would just say it's something to, to try. Um, especially if this is a specific issue you want to tackle spikes after meals. Um, so that brings us to the next thing, which is a Frezza, which is completely different. It's an inhaled insulin. Um, so everything we just mentioned was kind of classic injectable Excuse insulin. Excuse me. <laughs> it was like a good harmonica kind of like <laughs> looking effect. Yeah, that, that was. <laughs> All right. This is the inhaler device. You pop it open you pop out one of these little cartridges, comes in four, eight, and 12 units. Jeremy will talk about the dosing real quickly. Um, and you pop it in, you just close it, and you. Nice. It's like a gentle sound too. I was enjoying listening to you. You know what, you that. want to get it deep in your lungs. There's a lot of medications people take through their lungs. It gets absorbed super fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we had, uh, liquid insulin this fast, I mean, the world would be a better place. Yeah. So yeah, talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So, I mean, so everything I said about Lumjeb, Fiasp, you know, being a little bit faster, Afreza is completely different. So Afreza, it starts working almost immediately. It peaks in about 15 minutes or so. So that's like, it's, it's, it's hitting its max effect almost immediately versus again, having to wait 30 minutes or so for our traditional insulins to even start working. And then it's also gone in about an hour and a half. So it's a very rapid on, rapid off insulin that is perfect for a lot of different situations. I love it for treating those, like what I call stubborn highs. I heard someone call them a sticky high the other day and that's like appropriate too. <laughs> yeah. Where you just, they just don't seem to come down. And that's, that's actually a real phenomenon that the higher your blood sugar is, the more insulin resistant you are. So it does take more insulin to bring you down when you're high. And a Frezza can, you know, instead of, you know, four or five hours, you're finally starting to slope down. It can bring you down in a half an hour, an hour, and you can get on with your business. So that's a great place to use it. Or for just, you know, the initial inhalation for a meal, there's any, there's any number of places to use it. 
Um, I will say that because it's so different, it's inhaled, the different doses, all these types of things, I really would recommend checking out my talk that on the TCOID website. And this is for good information for finding all kinds of talks. If you go to tcoid.org, there's a section called the Video Vault. And we have hundreds of hours, thousands of hours now of free online video content. And it's organized by type one, type two, different things. Click on the different, whatever pertains to you. You can search for a Freza. I gave like a whole 30, 40 minute talk that also includes Fiasma and Lumjev, some more information on it. Um, because I think a Freza, the bottom line is it works really well. People don't know about it. And it's another good tool to have in the toolbox. Yeah. And to be honest, doctors don't know about it either. Yeah. And, you know, they'll start rolling their eyes to say you won't need it. They won't know how to prescribe it. So it is different, but uh, for people that go on it, they love it. And you could use it solely as your mealtime insulin for correcting too, or you can use it in combination with your pump or if you're on multiple daily injections. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's an impressive product. It right. really is. And it's again, something that everybody should at least be aware of. And you can, you know, I have patients, like you said, that use it with their pump once or twice a week. And then I have patients that use it for every meal and every correction. There's no wrong way to use it because it is kind of completely different. All right. So we did kind of practical tips, ways to approach your food. This was new therapies, new insulins we just talked about. Um, you know, what we didn't actually include in there is that, you know, some new newer basal insulins for people that are on injections, which real quick are Traceba and uh, Tugeo, which have been around for a few years now. And if you are on injections, uh, these new basal insulins are much better in terms of just they're more predictable, kind of a smoother profile. And that's something that could really help um, avoid, not, I wouldn't would say extreme highs, extreme lows, but just keep you more even keel. Well, if, if, it, if it's not even Steven, as a true basal should be, you might be correcting when the insulin loses activity and then you might correct too much. So it is secondarily related. Yeah. Having a good basal uh, insulin is like the foundation of any regimen. Totally. So if you're still on Lantus, which is great insulin, check out Traceba and Tugeo. All right. So that was medicines. Now we're going to talk about technology. So um, again, going without saying continuous glucose monitors, please use them. They're fantastic. If you used one that previously and it wasn't accurate or fell off or whatever the issue is, these are getting better and better. There's ways around all these issues. So like it's, it's really hard to manage diabetes, especially when you're on insulin without a CGM. Yeah. And I, we've been saying for years that if you have type one diabetes, having a CGM is the standard of care. And totally. I, I can tell you that it's the rare person with type one that would not benefit greatly from a CGM. So, you know, just since we stick with our show and tell theme, there's the Dexcom auto injector. Here's the box for the Libre 2. We also have the Eversense, the implantable CGM. And then of course, Medtronic makes their CGM. And I, I firmly believe that someday you're gonna look back and look at this show and uh, you're gonna hear that CGM is going to be the standard of care for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, and uh, Dr. Schaefer Bader, uh, who's screening the questions today, um, him and I, he and I did a Facebook Live on C CGM for people with type 2. And um, it's really true. It could be helpful at every stage, even if you have prediabetes, to see what happens to your blood sugars uh, when you eat certain foods, when you exercise, uh, and all the way to the other end of the spectrum for people with type two on multiple daily injections. So cool. it, it's key and we, it'll be more accessible. Insurance companies will get it. They'll realize it'll save them money. As soon as they realize it's gonna save them money, they, they're gonna put it in the drinking water. <laughs> CGM in the drinking water, I love it. <laughs> hey. All right, so uh, that's great. So how do we use these to prevent in this situation, we're talking about highs. Yeah, well, my big thing these days is where to set your alerts and alarm. So uh, for some of you that don't have a CGM, you, you can set your own limit of when you want to be alerted when you're getting too high. So typically when you go to a diabetes educator or a doctor and they say, here's your CGM, you should set your upper limit at 180 to 200 and your lower limit at 70 to 80. But my theory is this, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. But, well, this is uh, your thing. So yeah. Let's do okay. it. If you set your upper limit for 180, like, okay, that's when it's gonna ding and say, hey, you hit 180. You're already past the point because 
time and range is defined as 70 to 180. As soon as you hit 180, you're out of range. And we all live and die by our time and range, 70% or higher. So I'm a big believer of putting the alerts lower, like 150, 160. Now, some of you are going to say, oh, my God, it's going to drive me crazy. My spouse is going to leave me because she's going to be alerted all night. There's ways to deal with that. You have to change your attitude. Instead of saying, damn, I'm high again. When it goes off at 150, you say, awesome. I could catch it before I get to 180. And same on the other end, on the lower end. So think about that. Your alerts and alarms can improve your time and range and help you get off the roller coaster. Why not be notified early? I agree with that. I would say that you might want to do that incrementally. I mean, if somebody's starting or anyone sees nine and they're constantly high, maybe you start at 200 and then you can kind of bring it down slowly. Yeah, that's a wimpy way out, but I'll go with that. So, so, (laughs) but Steve and I do agree that um, the bottom line is that whatever you set your alert at, it should be a call to action. This isn't just a you know, alarm for the sake of bothering you that you're doing a bad job. It should be stop what you're doing for two seconds, take some insulin or whatever you need to do. Um, and, and that's where you should set your alarm is that like, whenever it goes off, I know that I feel comfortable taking a unit or two or whatever. So mine right now is set at 160. I think yours is 150. So we're like very, you were afraid to go to 150. I wasn't afraid. You kind of were. Well, whatever. <laughs> I feel well, yeah, like I I'll do question. it right now. I have a question for you. <laughs> Let's say uh, you're sitting at work yeah. And your goes off at it goes off. You hit 160. What are you going to look at next? And how are you going to respond to that? Yeah. So I would, I would look at the trend arrow. Right. Yeah. To see. So when it goes off at 160, I'm, I'm generally going to be taking some kind of insulin, a unit or two. And based on how quickly it's going up will be how aggressive I am with that bolus. Um, so that's, you know, kind of our next point is that these trend arrows really matter. You know, if I'm 160 and just kind of hovering right there, I might take one to two units. But if I'm 160, one arrow up, I might be taking four or five, whatever, you know, so that trend arrow, even with the same exact blood sugar can really determine how aggressive I am with my, my dose. So you're going to do one unit with your pen. Right now I would. How confident are you with getting one unit? Well, so, I mean, I make sure to prime every time I do it, you know, I take out my pen, I I take two units. I just make sure that there's no air bubbles because sometimes you do two units and nothing comes out. Um, and then I would take probably honestly two units. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and your response is, is going to be different. If you have a horizontal trend arrow and you're going to be going for a brisk walk. Yeah. Then you're good. You're good. Yeah. And if you're on a hybrid closed loop system where the basal rate is trying to always bring you down to about 120. I probably wouldn't I, do anything. Yeah. I don't do anything at all, but I can say if you're on shots and you know, you, you, you ate not too far in the distant past and one or two units isn't gonna drop you below hundred anyway. So why not get in that range before your next yeah. meal? And the, so the important thing about these trend arrows is that if you put you know, a blood sugar of 160 into your pump, it, it doesn't know really what the trend is. Yeah. So it, it might tell you 0.3 units or whatever, but if you're double arrows up, that's just garbage. So that's why these trend arrows can really help avoid this extreme high, because if you're really cranking, you need to be more aggressive with your insulin dosing and probably override whatever your pump is saying, yeah. giving yourself you know, more, sometimes two, even three times what you normally would based on that rate of change. Oh, if your pump doesn't know anything. <laughs> you know, your pump's pretty stupid when it comes to the direction of the blood sugar. So mm-hmm. we, we've determined that you need at least twice when you have two arrows up, and that's probably underdosing. Yeah. So it's, I've always said this, Jeremy, that if you don't look at the trend arrow, you're, it defeats the purpose of wearing a CGM. Right. And if you're, if your upper alert is set at 250, like some of patients that I've had and their, your A1C is high, your average glucose is 212 wearing a CGM, you're defeating the purpose when your alerts are so high and the excuse is always the same, you know, is that they don't want to be bugged. Right. Well, you know what? You, you got to change your attitude. Well, I just set my alarm at 140. What's yours at? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we kind of mentioned these these hybrid closed loop systems. We should talk specifically about it. Um, these have really been a game changer, um, yeah. specifically with the Tandem Control IQ is really the first system that I think is a true hybrid closed loop system. It, it really works very well. And as a quick reminder of what it does is that as your blood sugar is, is, is creeping up, it can increase the basal rate in your pump to automatically try to bring you back down into range. And it can even give you micro boluses every hour to try to automatically correct your blood sugars. 
This works extremely well overnight when you're just lying there and it's dealing with these kind of slow trends in one direction or another. Um, the algorithm is nowhere near good enough to handle a whole meal. So you still have to bolus and do all that stuff you normally would. But for these, these, these kind of ebbs and flows, it's remarkable. And I don't think I truly appreciated how much it was doing for me until I just went back on shots. And yeah. geez, my time and range is, is really taking a hit um, because I, I was pretty reliant on this system. Yeah, when I first met Jeremy, you know, he, he, he had half drinking bottles of Coke everywhere in our office, on his bed stand. And that has pretty much disappeared overnight. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they are amazing. And I just had clinic yesterday and I think seven out of the eight folks with type one were on a hybrid closed loop system, mostly the tandem control IQ. And uh, there really wasn't much to do. Yeah. We talked about their favorite Peloton instructor. We had big arguments of who was the best. <laughs> and I talk about their dog and uh, maybe make sure they got their eye examined. But honestly, we made jokes about the university is going to let us go because people really don't need us anymore. Don't you think? Well, we're not there yet, but yeah. For some I mean, of these hybrid- We would be happy if that took that happened and we didn't have to work. But I think, you know, again, what really struck me, as I said, I went to 340 this morning. I haven't, I don't think I've been over 300 since I went on the system. And just being on one of these systems can really help with these truly extreme highs. Um, and when, you know, when you're over 250, 280, you feel like crap. Yeah. And, and emotionally too, you feel like a failure. So anyways, if, you, if you're thinking about upgrading, now is really the time to do it. Another nice thing about these systems is that they are becoming um, downloadable. So when there's a new kind of update, you can literally download it versus feeling like you're locked into this particular yeah. pump. And that's, yeah. that's a big deal. Well, I should just mention that, it, you know, we're going to have four systems on the market. So we talked about the tandem control IQ. Then there are people who are looping. If you don't know what that is, uh, look it up on the website. Then coming out soon uh, will be the Omnipod 5. People who like using the Omnipod. Um, and you, and that'll be a hybrid closed loop system. Of course, Medtronic has their 670G and some of their newer models as well. Right. So really it's getting to the point that, you know, kind of a traditional pump isn't going to exist, that every pump is kind of upgrading to these new systems. And so just like we talked about five years ago, the different pump options you have, they're all kind of the same options, but they now yeah. are integrated with, yeah. with CGM and these hybrid And these closers. pumps that used to be dumb, they're now pretty smart because all of the uh, insulin they give you or don't give you is based on your predicted blood sugar, the data they get from the CGM that communicates. It's, it's pretty impressive, folks. It's not a cure, but it's gonna, it's a stepping stone to keep us healthy until a cure comes along. Yeah. We better get to hypo. We should. All right. So let's scroll on down to, to hypo here. So some practical tips. All right. So first of all, we mentioned, and that this is important to talk about again. So again, we're switching to lows now. Um, that most lows after actually come after a high that, you know, what happens is just like what I said, your blood sugar is 250, whatever. You take an injection, it's so slow that 30 minutes later, you haven't moved at all. So you do another one and you can just kind of crash because you're so um, angry and you just want to bring your blood sugars down that you can overdo it. You go low and you kind of get on this roller coaster. So that's why, again, trying to avoid that spike in the first place is the ideal situation. But if you do go high, being, you know, somewhat conservative with your, your, um, corrections, so yeah. you don't overdo it and, and kind of go low. You know what? I'm shaking my head because I know this, but I do it so often. I say to my girlfriend, I say, I, I think my insulin went bad. She goes, no, it didn't go bad. Do not give yourself anymore. I, I go, Jamie, it's bad. I give myself like maybe three boluses and then crash a Rooney every single time. Yep. As soon as Steve says the words, my insulin's bad, I just start Cracking open the OJ. I mean, honestly, Steve, how often does your insulin go bad? I can't remember. Like never. It's just, it's just, it's just you're up, you're, you're upset, and you want to tell yourself. No, something. I really, I really thought there was a problem with the insulin. You're full of it. I really did. Okay. All right. We already said try not to overeat. Keep something by your bed. That is really, you know, helpful when it terms of like that's actually like treating lows. So, um, but again, like you just strap yourself down or whatever you need to do because those like treating lows is is tough. Um, but let's talk about some new therapies when it comes to, to low blood sugar. So first of all, what, what is the treatment for low blood sugar? It's always, it's carbs when you can 
when you can eat or drink, you should, should do that. You should, you know, just eat 15 grams of carbs. Liquid seems to work a little bit better. You know what I like to do, by the way, this is a practical tip. Um, I have glucose tabs like everywhere. I have them by my bed. I have them in my car. I have them in my work bag. I have them at work because I hate glucose tabs. And I know I'm not going to just like be hungry for glucose tabs. I mean, I used to have Skittles around, but I would actually just eat them um, because I like Skittles. I don't like glucose tabs. So I know they're just there for when I'm low. I'm not going to just kind of snack on them. Um, but that's helpful because there's nothing worse than being low and not having stuff. That's like a, that's a nightmare. You just, just feel panicked. You know what? When you don't have anything around, you will get low. Yeah. That's my theory. Yeah. If you have something with you, you're better off. You know what I've done a couple of times? I've gotten a bag of these Starburst uh, jelly beans. Okay. And it tells you how many grams per serving. Mm -hmm. And I'll get those little luncheon Ziploc bags, the small ones. Right. And I'll put, I'll put as much as 15 grams in there. Now, I also read uh, a really good study that if you're a big guy, 15 grams isn't enough. And that, you know, if you're going to do 20, you're not going to rebound high. And, you know, kind of the big, it makes sense. The bigger body, the bigger volume of distribution. But the key is, is to limit it. You're right. Yeah. You get a big bag of jelly beans and you can't stop. Right. And the other thing, this is where trend arrows come in again, too, that not all lows are created the same. We've all just done the kind of gradual, you're 80 and you're 79, you're 80, like whatever. Then five grams of carbs or something might actually do, do fine. But if you're really cranking down, um, you're going to need more. So keep that in mind. Um, all right. So, but new therapies, and this really comes to glucagon. So, and, and glucagon, keep in mind, is reserved for those extreme uh, lows when you can't treat yourself and you need somebody to actually give you an injection of glucagon. We've had this, you know, glucagon kit available. I hope you don't mind me reaching into your bag here. No, please. You, you kind of started grabbing for it. Um, did you want to open it? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I share. <laughs> So yeah, this, is, this is what it looks like. And hopefully you guys have all seen this. Everybody who's on insulin, type one, type two, needs some glucagon around. Um, but the problem with this is it expires. You probably can't see, but in here is this little like cube of glucagon. So if Steve was having a seizure, I'd have to inject this liquid in here, shake it up, dissolve it, draw it back up, and then inject it into Steve. And as a physician, I can handle that. Um, but even as a physician, if Steve's having a seizure, I don't want to be mixing stuff and drawing stuff up. So this just isn't that practical if somebody's having a severe low. Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, what, what's the expiration on that? Can you see that? I don't know. Oh, it's, it's actually April of 2020. Oh, this is a brand new one. <laughs> um, well, you know what? The thing is, uh, time is of the essence as yeah. well. And the sooner you treat someone who's so out of it, they can't treat themselves the better. And I've had patients, uh, and I'm sure you have too, where, you know, you take someone who's not medically oriented, they have no clue They they, you can't train everybody around you and they can't figure it out. Right. And in fact, I had a patient whose dad injected just the diluting fluid didn't dissolve the glucagon, but the newer formulations, uh, we're going to show you where the glucagon is stable in solution and the spray. So right. which one do you want to talk about first? Well, first, I, if you don't mind, I want to give like a little bit of background on, on lows real quick, sure. just because just sure. to remind people that most type ones have one to two hypo events per week. They are unfortunately common. We know that these don't really cause brain damage or long-term problems. People ask that, you know, all the time. All the time yeah. So, you know, we don't want to encourage getting lows, but unfortunately it's, it's something that, that, is, that is somewhat typical. Um, but, you know, people that get lows, it can, it can cause all kinds of issues. I've had this so many patients lately that have had a really bad low at some point, maybe 10 years ago. And now they just have their blood sugars at 300 all the time because they don't want to go anywhere near being low. So having these lows can really mess with people's heads because you feel like crap. It's really dangerous. Um, we're injecting this medication insulin all the time that can kill us. You yeah, know? It, so we have to be aware of that and have these kind of emergency things around for if things do go south. So, all right. Well, let me just say that one end of the spectrum is having a seizure and passing out and unfortunately passing away. Yeah. That's one end of the spectrum. Fortunately, that doesn't happen very much, but there's, uh, there's other gradations of hypo and they've clearly shown that uh, kids that have a lot of hypo, even if it's mild hypo, they don't do well as well at, at school. Um, people at work, they have more absenteeism and presenteeism. That's a great word. It means you're at work, but you're not really at work. So, you know. But everybody does that, right? 
<laughs> well, nowadays with COVID, uh, yeah. but I, I would just say that uh, for those of you folks that have had hypos, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. And it could scare the bejesus out of you. And I know you just had a young woman who was really afraid of ever getting below 300. Right. And I had a patient like that too. And it was one of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to him at a rock concert. And I think he only saw me once. He, I, I guess I might've come on too strong with him. I can't, I tried to be, you know, gentle, but he, you know, he, there's a special way to approach these people. And I think you're learning it will help with from Bill Polonsky, you know, clinical psychologist that deals with this kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyways, there's like hypoglycemia can cause all kinds of issues. The other last thing I'll say about that is there's lots of you out there who never want to be high and you like to ride low and your blood sugar is your 60 or 70 all the time. You say like, that's the great place to be. Um, but one of these bad lows can really scare you or can really cause problems. And the other thing patients will say all the time is why do I need glucagon? I never had to use it. Well, you don't, you don't need it until you need it. Um, and when you need it, you better have it there. You know, in my 25 years of having type one diabetes, I've had to really inject it once, but thank God I had it. Um, I can tell that story if we have time later, but tell, tell us our, our new, new options. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Let's, let's talk about the first one, which is, uh, made by Lily. It's called Baxini, uh, and it's a nasal spray. So here it is. Um, you, Put it in your nostril. That's it. Or somebody else would put it in your nostril. Yeah. So this is if you're having a seizure, or whatever, on the ground. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, you're, you're supposed to be so out of it, you can't uh, eat uh, yourself. And right. You don't want to be eating or drinking if you're out of it because the stuff will go in your lungs. It's called aspiration, and that's not good either. And, and so each kit that we're going to show you comes with two, and the, the person giving it just puts it up the nostril. I put it up here, but Jeremy just used it. And... Uh, <laughs> And both of them are, both of these formulations, um, they work really fast. Right. With 14 minutes So, or you something. know, if, if Steve had a seizure, I could just put this up his nose. I don't have to mix it. He doesn't have to like breathe it in, anything like that. Super good at quick recovery. I think it's stable for two years, right? Yep. At room yep. temperature. Yep. That's super important too, because of the other one, people say it expires and then they never get another one. But every two years, everybody should have something like this. The other option is this, you know, there's actually two new in, in the Zealand one also. Um, this Givoke Hypo Pen. It's much like an EpiPen. It's all mixed in here together. You can't see the needle. You just push it down and it's an injection. Um, so there, again, there's no mixing. This is very easy to, to give. So again, everybody out there should have a prescription for glucagon. And importantly, since likely you're not going to be the one using it, you need to tell your friend, family member, whoever you live with, whoever might be using it, where it is and how to use it. Because again, that's what's going to save your life. Yeah, I mean, this is it. It's like a gluc. It's like an EpiPen. Jesus, I don't want any glucagon. Are you sure that's oh, a shoot. sample? Oh shoot, this is not a sample. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then there's another one called Zegalog now, right? Yeah, that, yeah. that just recently got approved. So there's like all this new stuff going on in glucagon. We've had this Lily one for 50 years, thank God. But now, like, they, again, they're so much easier to use. And so everybody really needs to have one. Super important. Well, tell, tell the folks out there how important these newer formulations of glucagon are when it comes to the artificial pancreas. Yeah, so basically now that these are stable, um, in a liquid, we can start playing around with putting these in insulin pumps. There's one uh, company called Beta Bionics that's working on an insulin pump system that uses insulin to bring your blood sugars down, glucagon to bring your blood sugars up. And we'll see, it looks really efficacious, but we'll see kind of how it all pans out. But now that we can use glucagon, we can start using it in different places. Basically. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, mini dose glucagon. So right. we, we talk about, you know, not over treating ourselves, but in, in the future, could you imagine you get out a glucagon pen and you say, ah, blood sugar's a hundred, let's say 95 and dropping. Let's just dial up, you know, X amount. Boom. You give yourself glucagon. You, you not only stop in the track, so you, you avoid that extreme hunger and want to eat everything in the kitchen feeling right. and you don't rebound. Right. So that's going to take some time to research. And that's I'm looking forward cool. to that. Yeah, because everything we just mentioned is, again, is for those extreme lows. This is a huge dose of glucagon meant to just blast your blood sugars up to, to, to save your life. Um, but what we're talking about is that now there's this potential of just, yeah, a, a unit or two, whatever that is, of glucagon, you know, before you exercise or whatever it is. I mean, 
everybody hates going to the gym and, and, you know, on the treadmill or whatever, you get low and you have to drink a soda, you know, that's just calories you're trying to burn. It'd be nice just to take a touch of glucagon to, to kind of stay in range. So we got 40 seconds before we get to Q&A. Let's talk a little bit about technology real quick. Are there things you want to highlight? Maybe your alarms again um, for uh, well, getting low? Yeah, well, we've, we've already talked about the hybrid closed loop systems that will uh, they turn the they turn off your insulin if it predicts you're going to get low in 30 minutes, and that really helps mm -hmm. hypoglycemia. And the, the limits are important. You don't want to put 70. I'll, I'll say real quick with these hybrid closed loop systems because they're already trying to treat your low. I did notice that when I actually had to treat my low, I would have to use less carbs mm. because I already have less insulin on board. So that's something to keep in mind that the, the system shut off your insulin for maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes or whatever. You don't need as much, as many carbs to kind of bring your blood sugars up if you were not on one of these. Yeah, that's a good thought. I, I didn't think about that, but that's probably true. Um, but the, the other thing I was saying, what was I saying when you were- I have no me? idea. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> a new, new Alzheimer's man I just got approved. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but, and then alerts. So make sure you have your low alarm on. So the 55 one, you can't get rid of, but so many times people turn off their low alert and rely on just the 55. Why not have one set at 80? That's where mine's at because I want to be alerted when I'm still coherent. You know, if I get, you know, woken up at night when I'm 79, I'm still with it. I can be, you know, more conservative with my treatment. If I get woken up when I'm 55, just all bets are off. Well, I remember, I remember what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> There's a thing called a lag time. That's really important, you know, because these sensors measure glucose in the subcutaneous tissue, which it, it's like 10, 15 minutes behind what's really in your blood. So if your blood sugar is dropping and it, you, it, your alert goes off at 70, you could easily be 50, 55. And that's why it's important to be 80 at the minimum. And some people do 90. Uh, they, you know, they can catch themselves before they feel like eating everything in the kitchen sink. So, yeah. All right. I think that's it. So let's, let's get to some of our Q and A's and, you know, pe people can keep entering them. Our, our great friend and colleague, Dr. Schaefer Bader is on the, you know, Zoom meeting, answering questions and then kind of feeding these to us. Um, so I'll just go through them. So the first one is, how do you lower your blood glucose if you aren't on insulin or using a basal insulin only? So it's probably somebody with type two diabetes that's, that's maybe on basal insulin or medications and getting highs in their blood sugar. How do you bring it down? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, you could be on oral medications too. Um, it comes down to, um, the well, first of all, if you're going to eat and you're high, do everything you can to delay that meal. Second, try to take all the carbs out of the meal, you know, make, make sure you're not eating any fruit with that meal as best you can delay and then eat less. <laughs> you can eat more later when your blood sugar stabilizes. And, you know, this sounds really dr drastic, but maybe not uh, is to get out and just get on your treadmill in your garage, your exercise cycle. If you don't have any equipment, just walk briskly around the block. You'd be surprised to see how that brings down your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And when you exercise, the insulin that your body makes, assuming that it's making a, some insulin being a type two, it'll make that insulin work more effectively. Yeah. Steve and I did this video on how to eat three donuts and stay in range. You gotta check that out on our website. Yeah. And um, it was a competition to try to stay between 70 and 180 the whole time. I won. And I definitely won. There was no question about it. Um, and at a couple of times, our blood sugar started kind of ramping up and both of us went outside and did some stairs. And it's, I was even blown away how quickly that, you know, kind of helps curb the, the tide or whatever. Yeah. Um, and let me just say, if you have type two and you're getting high after eating all the time and th these kind of techniques are, you have to do every meal, then you probably need to talk to your yeah, caregiver. About a new medication or yeah. insulin or whatever. Could be a, one of these new GLP ones, SGLT twos, all these newer drugs. That, all these type twos, they have so many options. Yeah. I'm, Jealous. Yeah. All we too. got is insulin um, and now glucagon. Hooray. Um, Next question. All right. I'm drinking one glass of white wine, one half hour before dinner. When do I bolus? So basically, again, he, he's the alcohol expert yeah. <laughs> from personal experience. This is not gives, coffee. And this there's is a just straight vodka. And there's a lecture on that on our website. Yeah. It's, I would, I don't know if I call it a lecture. So, um, <laughs> show and tell. So, what it is, is it's, for 45 minutes, Steve and I drinking alcohol in real time and showing the effects on our blood sugar because alcohol has different effects on your blood sugar based on what you're drinking. So I was drinking beer 
lots of carbs. My blood sugar went through the roof. He was drinking kind of hard alcohol. He stayed really kind of even keel. Wine is actually very low carb too. So you, you don't have to really bolus for wine per se. It might actually drop your blood sugar. So I would almost take that one glass of wine out of the equation, but everybody should watch this video. It ends up, you know, and it's silly because by the end of it, we are intoxicated, but that's kind of the point also is that it can be hard to, to stay engaged with your diabetes when you're drunk. Um, and so you have to be really smart when it comes to alcohol and diabetes and educate yourself. And that's why we did this video. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. With, with white wine, you're, you're good. Yeah. All right. How do you determine how many hours and or how many units to determine an extended bolus? Are you familiar with the 25 rule for high fat protein meals? So first, what I'll say about this is um, it's good to just acknowledge that fat and protein will raise your blood sugar, but it's typically much delayed. So the classic example is pizza where, you know, there's carbs in pizza, but it's the cheese that has a fat and protein and yeah. pepperoni and things like that. You ever look at the box that your pizza? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just grease. Yeah. Now I want some pizza. <laughs> um, but so, you know, you eat your pizza, your blood sugar is kind of doing fine. And then it's two, three, four hours later that your blood sugar starts, you know, going up. So how do you deal with that? You can do these extended boluses. There's all different kinds of rules in terms of, of how to do that. In general, if you're eating a high fat, high protein meal, you're gonna require 20 to 30% more insulin in general. And you can split that up with anywhere between 30 and 50% in the beginning. And you know the other 50 to 70% over the next two to three hours. With Control IQ, you can only do, I think a two hour extended bolus because it's always kind of updating things. But to be honest, what I do is I take my best guess initially and then, you know, I keep checking in with my CGM and if I need to bolus some more, use a Fraser, I will. Um, so I, I, I personally prefer those more kind of frequent taps than these extended boluses. Yeah, well, you know, thank you for that question. It's a sophisticated question. But for those of you that aren't familiar with pumps, you know, you have a, a square wave bolus. So instead of giving 10 units all at once, you give five units right away and the other five you can program two, three hours later. And, and not enough people use that mm -hmm. option. But uh, the hybrid closed loop systems are pretty darn good uh, and they're forgiving with that kind of, you know, ingestion of fat. And it usually makes the adjustment over time. Yeah. So how do you deal with high glucose from things like acute illness or steroids? You want to take that first? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, we all have to deal with that. And the basic answer is fast acting insulin. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially steroids, uh, steroids can save your life, but they can also wreck your diabetes. And it comes down to looking at your blood sugars quite a bit. If you don't have a CGM, then you got to really prick your fingers a hell of a lot yeah. and keep giving yourself boluses because prednisone and steroids make you insulin resistant. It's almost impossible to get low and your requirements. Don't be afraid to give yourself every extra insulin every two to three hours. Yeah. Um, does a Fresa work with uh, prednisone? Yeah, you know, so pre like steroids is, is the toughest thing ever. So, and it's important to know that you're getting steroids. So I think people know if they're taking prednisone, they can kind of put that together. But when people get injections in their knees oh, or their yeah. spine or things like that, that can really make your blood sugars go high for the next couple of days. So just being aware of that is step one. And orthopedic surgeons, they can't even spell prednisone. Yeah. They don't even, they don't tell people that I just put in enough prednisone to raise your blood sugar to 500. Right. And depending on the type of uh, steroid they put in your knee, some of it's longer acting. Could be there a couple of weeks. So in the typical time course of prednisone is if you take it in the morning, it'll mess up your blood sugars kind of afternoon and evening and then typically come back in, in the normal range by the next night. So you might require up to an extra unit per milligram of prednisone. You know, if you're on 20 milligrams of prednisone, it might be another 20 units throughout the day. That's just kind of a-, a That's the 20-20 rule or- No, that's just the, the Pettis rule, but, or Edelman rule if it doesn't work, Pettis rule if it does work, I think. <laughs> well, you know what? In diabetes, it comes down to trial and error. Yeah, so, and when you get sick, you know, you get all your hormones going, stress, adrenaline, that can raise your blood sugar. It can also, if you're not eating and vomiting, it can cause you to go to low. So it's just about frequent monitoring, CGM, kind of more rapid touches and in, in interaction with your diabetes. It's, it's a tough time where the goal is to just get you through it. You don't, you know, let yourself be a little bit higher than you might normally be when you're sick. Um, if you're, you know, 180, 200 for a couple of days, so be it. You just want to stay out of the extreme highs and extreme lows while you're going through whatever it is. Yeah. And the bottom line is, you know, you want to, it's 
testing, testing, and testing. Drink a lot of fluids that are low in calories, unless you think you're going to get low. And uh, one, one last note is that just because you're sick and you're not eating, your blood sugar still may be extremely high from being sick. And don't <laughs> be careful. Don't just stop your insulin. Uh, check your blood sugar. Yeah, if your blood sugar is low, you want to hold off. But uh, that's really key. You don't don't guess. You know, you just got to test your blood sugar. Test, don't guess. Remember that study? I love it. All right. So I love this question because it gets me to set up another video of ours. How do you travel with all your diabetes oh. stuff? What about TSA and full body detectors? Well, you guessed it. We made a video about this, including a little funny intro where I'm going through the metal detector and I have to keep taking things off. And spoiler alert, I end up completely naked. Um, but it's like blurred out. It's it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> That's the word I would have used. Um, you didn't have to look at yourself. So, and then Steve and I actually literally got our suitcases and packed everything. All the supplies we needed, thinking about you know TSA and all those kinds of things. So again, go onto the video vault, search for travel, whatever. It's a you know probably thirty minute talk or less. Um, yeah, but but now good. people are traveling again, and you know I I just went uh, got an airplane for the first time in a long time, and I felt like I'd never done it before. I was like had to remember about my list and everything on a pack and stuff like that. So check out that video. Um, because it, it's a good topic and it requires a little bit of effort. To yeah. And I, I should say, you know, it's Murphy's law. Uh, whatever can go wrong will go around wrong unless you're prepared. Yeah. So you got to really think about it. Now, I love this one because I'm just starting to feel like we have talks for everything. How do you prevent lows during walking or other exercise? Eat carbs beforehand. So this one, our video is pending. So we just did a, last Friday, we did a, a video where I was on a, a Peloton, a spin bike for 45 minutes, and Steve was walking for 45 minutes. And we talk about how to prepare for exercise and how to avoid lows during and spiking high after. And um, so I'm really excited for Eric to, to get that all together because I'm going to watch it. But there's two things that happen during exercise. People go low during exercise because they're burning glucose and then they can spike high after. And we talk a lot about how to prevent those things. But when it comes to avoiding the lows, really you can either try to go into the exercise a little bit higher, maybe under bolus for your meal prior. You can eat carbs before or actually during the exercise. They say, you know, 15 grams of carbs every 15 to 30 minutes, depending on what you're doing. Um, but I hate doing that. I hate eating or drinking while I'm exercising. Again, it seems like you're, you're missing the point. So um, I try to reduce my basal with my pump and I try to go into the, the exercise a little bit higher um, to allow myself some cushion. Yeah, I'm just thinking of all the variables mm -hmm. that come into play. If you have type two and let's say you're on oral medications only, even basal insulin, you probably don't have to worry too much about mild exercise. But if you're on fast acting insulin uh, and, you know, if, especially if you're a type one that might be more insulin sensitive, you have to think about, uh, you know, where you are at least one hour before you exercise yeah. and, and better yet, two hours before. And, you know, when's your last bolus? When's the last time you ate anything? How much uh, are you going to exercise? How long? How intense? Uh, and so that is the one area that takes uh, that is hard to do and leads to a lot of frustration. So, right. so you mentioned low during. When then somebody after? actually said like, you know, intense exercise. So first of all, don't take your pump off during exercise. If you can avoid that and you really can, um, that'll help avoid any, any high spikes um, uh, during. And then to avoid the spike after doing a cool down and kind of a prolonged cool down is really helpful. Steve didn't do a cool down in our thing and he rebounded high because he didn't respect the cool down. But that means if you're doing something intense for afterwards, 10, 15 minutes of walking or just, you know, a slow uh, thing on the, a spin cycle can really help your body kind of cool down and avoid that spike. Yeah. For the, for you that, for those of you that are interested in intense exercise, I mean, basically what I did was I reduced my insulin uh, in my pump the delivery by 60, 70% an hour before. And I tried to go into exercise like around 150, 160 with a horizontal trend arrow. Uh, and, you know, that you'll have to watch the video, but it didn't work out perfectly. Yeah. But you really have to plan ahead of time. You have to have minimal insulin on board. And once again, if you're if your insulin is really way below what you normally would use during exercise and you got epinephrine coming out and you don't do your, your cool down, you will shoot up 
after exercising. And I think a lot of people get so frustrated with that. Right. All right. So we got a minute left. Let's do a little bit of a rapid fire here. So how quickly does Fresa expire? What about if the blister pack is already open? Um, so first of all, if you keep it in the fridge, it's like insulin. It can, it can last for a very, very, very long time. When you um, take it out and you have it in a blister pack that is that is still sealed, I think it's 10 days or so that it's good, you know, much longer than you should need because you're going to go through this pretty quickly. Once you pop it open, like I've already taken one out of this blister pack, then it's for three days. So for me, if you're using it, you know, somewhat regularly, that's it's, it's definitely enough time. And that's like what they say. It actually, you know, I found that it actually works much longer than that, but let's keep doing rapid fire. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, does it affect the lungs? Well, so far they are following it super closely. If you're a smoker and you have asthma or what we call COPD, no, you shouldn't be using it, but they are following, uh, the health of lungs of people on a Fresa. And so far, uh, no, no issues. Okay. So we're going to wrap it up here. Let's think about kind of final pearls. And I think, you know, for the questions that we didn't answer, we're going to try to address them and email them to people uh, because there's some good questions. Yeah a thumbs up from Eric. Okay. So my final pearl of wisdom is we just like, just think about everything that we just went through all the crap we have. To I'm deal exhausted. With. I know. <laughs> like dealing with highs and lows. And so it's a lot. And I always say that, that diabetes is unlike any other disease because all the burden that we put on the patient, you know, I mean, and people constantly feeling like, gosh, I should do better. I need to do this. I need to do that. You know, can you imagine if somebody came in and said like, Hey, I have pneumonia. I, I need to do better. You'd be like, no, you have pneumonia. Let's, you know, let's treat it like whatever. This isn't your problem, your fault. So if you're frustrated, you're not alone. These are all tips and tricks to try to just keep you in range. But remember, we all still go high. We all still go low. The idea with diabetes is not to have perfect blood sugars. It's to live a long and healthy life. And if you stay within a reasonable range, keep your A1C and your time and range kind of at goal, you can live just as long, if not longer than somebody without diabetes and be happy and healthy. Yeah. You keep your A1C, you know, below seven or even close to that. And I have people who want to get to below six, you know, please be reasonable, especially mm -hmm. with this condition. Lastly, I want to say to add on is that for you folks with type two, we haven't forgotten about you uh, in the TCOID book, which you can download free. Uh, there's a whole uh, section written on non-pharmacologic methods to reduce your blood sugar. And I, I touched on a few, but we want to make sure we include everybody on this. So cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining us at TCOID Studios. Yep. Thanks Eric for steering the ship. Thanks to Schaefer Bader for answering questions and, and feeding these to me. I feel like we got a real high tech setup here. Um, and this has been fun. Yeah. And we'll answer all the questions. And when you get a follow-up email from us uh, to show you where you can watch it again or forward it, uh, it'll be... It'll be on there. Cool. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.